And the Gulf of Maine is a vulnerable ecosystem. It's a you know sea within the sea, if you understand the oceanography of it. Where they want to install these would be on seamounts, so you, they want to go off you know, 20 or 30 miles offshore, so they figure that's where most people can't see them, so out of sight, out of mind. And as we always say, the, the seabed is the limit here. There is no limitation in terms of water depth for deployments. They want to mount these on seamounts. Well, seamounts are outcroppings, little mountain ranges that are in the ocean. Well, the higher the seamount, the less materials they'll need to install them. So it, it makes sense uh, economically for them to hit these seamounts. Well, the seamounts are where all of ocean life thrives. So you've got small fish, big fish. You've got the little fish are hiding there. The top predators, like great white sharks, are there and they're hunting the small fish. And it's, it's a cat and mouse game and they are counting on that shelter to hide from the predator. And the predator is also hiding as well trying to catch the prey. And that's where the small fish will continue to grow, continue to grow. And now where are the fish gonna to grow to if they don't have the seamounts to live? All marine life, where is it gonna go? If you go offshore further, there's less area that they can actually live. They need to go shallower. So you're expecting all of that sea life all of a sudden to move close to shore? Well, if you move close to shore, now you're close to where boat traffic is. Now you have more human interaction with all of these different marine animals, whether it's the whales. The whale migration is going to be thrown off by that. We'll see the effect in the ecosystem with the windmills. All of the migratory seabirds that go up and down the East Coast, they've recorded over 200 types of migratory birds over the years that frequent off those islands. The closer all these migratory birds get to land, they're going to get closer to the eagles and things like that. So the birds of prey, they want to stay away from them. So they're off there where they're pretty safe. Well, they're not going to be very safe anymore because now they've got hundreds of whirring blades right in the way, just getting ready to chowder them up. Now, where's the Audubon Society with that? Where is their uh, outrage that now you've all of a sudden set up a salad shooter in the Gulf of Maine that's going to grind up all of these birds as they're going either south or north? You've got the gannets and the petrels, all these different seabirds that stay there. We're not just talking about seagulls like you'd see up to McDonald's. One island off here is called Seal Island. There's a population of puffins out there. Now Seal Island is about 20 miles off the coast. And now, boom, we set in these 750 foot sweeping structures endangered puffins will die. To pad the wallets of big corporations, get them all billions of taxpayer dollars, and we can all pay two or three times what we normally would pay for our electric bill. We are looking at floating platforms that are 300 feet by 300 feet. They're massive concrete structures upon which a wind turbine that is gonna be 700 to 800 feet is gonna be situated on top. Now, Lobsterman is in a 40-foot vessel <laughs> coming around these. You've got blades, three blades. Each blade is the size of a football field, the length of a football field, spitting. And they are anchored down with anchors that are 30 to 40 feet per anchor, chain links that are nine feet each. The metal is six inches in diameter. So when you think about the actual physical structure that they're putting in the ocean and you wonder, what are the environmental impacts? If you're a fisherman, you are extremely worried. It is truly an industrialization. They are massive. The turbine spinning breaks up the whole surface layer an inch of the water column, so it disperses all of the phytoplankton and zooplankton, which is the forage for our endangered whales. We know that the chains are dragging on the bottom, disrupting the benthic habitat. They require long cables that are to be buried, um, can mess with lobsters. I mean, there are just countless potential environmental impacts that we really don't understand how massive they are. And it's not just one turbine, they are wind farms. Wind farms? This thing I'm proposing is a wind ranch. Thank you, Senator. We stand corrected. They are wind ranches. So we're looking at 12, but Massachusetts is in the process of building one with 84 wind turbines. So the potential for the growth and how these are gonna to move together will both have an impact in a small area, but as they start to grow, you know, really potentially destructive consequences for the Gulf's ecosystem. These chain links are very heavy. So that's the size of a, a bed of a pickup truck. 
and then they'll have seven to nine times the depth of the water for these chains. So if you're in 300 feet of water on a seamount, you've got an excess of at least a thousand feet of chain with no strain on it that's dragging back and forth across the bottom. The slack that is created by having that much scope, now that's going to drag back and forth across the bottom. Now you've got this platform and then you've got the bottom of the ocean and that platform is going around in tide and wind. So these three chains that they'll come down from three different corners with seven to nine times the length, so that's all going to be dragging around here. So you've got a seamount, three anchors, all of this chain, and as that moves around, that's going to grind down the ecosystem, the home of small fish, big fish, lobsters, crabs, everything. Nothing lives on a flat plane. It's kind of like in a desert you'll find life, but it won't be much. You know, we're not going after sidewinder snakes. So you go to a mountain, peaks and valleys, that's where you find life in the forest. And of course, with marine growth, say it would be kelp and things like that, that would be on the seamount. So those would be like trees in the forest. So now as this chain goes around, those trees in that forest are gone instantly because it doesn't take anything to chafe those off. That chain will just scour the bottom first thing. So now I have these giant bald spots that used to house all sorts of marine life. So everything that lives there now, they're gonna have to find a new home. Well, I don't know where they're gonna go live because the Gulf of Maine's been their home for eons. Those fish have gotta go somewhere. If they lose their home there, where are they gonna go? You expect them all coming in closer to shore? That's not naturally where they would be. So now you're altering the ecosystem and the marine life to adapt to us going in forcefully and doing something completely unnatural. All of your commercial fisheries are designed now to be as little impact and to take a specific portion of that species so that the species is sustainable. When you go into a giant industrial complex that they're trying to build with these offshore windmills, now you're just going in and you are doing heavy construction over where everything is living and you are displacing them. They go further offshore, there's no seamounts out there, there's nothing for them to live in, so they will die. Drive them inshore, water temperatures are changing between winter and summer. Some species of fish want water temperatures that are more consistent with those seamounts, not getting close to shore, where all of a sudden that water temperature drops because as we have winter come on here on the coast of Maine and, and all of New England, the mountains get snow, that runoff comes out in the spring, the water temperature is exceedingly cold. That's not what they want. We're just disrupting the building blocks of sea life all the way up to the top predators. These are all heavy industrial materials that when they're installed are destructive and they will destroy the seamounts, they'll destroy the homes for the fish, and for the lobsters and for the crabs and all sea life. Um, the only thing I don't think would be disrupted by it would be the slime eels and they are the very bottom of the food chain and they just go along and eat dead things. So I don't think we want to trade a, a robust and productive Gulf of Maine for an overabundance of slime eels the ecosystem that we have spent decades trying to protect. We know it's fragile. All of the work that has been done up until now to protect the environment, now it's like to fight climate change, we're going to destroy the ecosystem. It does not make sense. It all has to go in. If you're trying to do something for the betterment of the earth and for mankind, it all should be working in symmetry. It shouldn't be destroy this to save that. It doesn't work like that. You destroy it, there's gonna be an effect from it, and a negative effect, it's not gonna be a good effect. So in the whole scheme of things, who benefits from this? They're saying that the world is gonna benefit in 100 years. I say they're benefiting now, and they will benefit until the money runs out, because when the money runs out, are they gonna go out there and install those windmills for free? Not gonna happen. Even if the material is provided, would they donate their time? I don't think it's that important to them. I think what it is is you've got a multinational corporation who has saddled up alongside of a government leader and they've convinced the other politicians that, hey, you know what? This is a good way to make some money. Why don't you invest in this? We've got the people convinced that, hey, this is for the good. Forget the destruction on the ecosystem. Forget the uh, destruction of the coastal communities. They're looking to make a profit. I'm not opposed to someone making a profit, but this is not a good profit. You are being deceitful 
and how you get the funding and you're being deceitful on what the end result will be a hundred years from now. From the fishing industry's perspective, there has been a lot of talk about collaborating with the fishing industry, but when the fishing industry steps up, attends these meetings, expresses our concerns, we are unilaterally dismissed and told that this development is going to move forward and we need to sort of fall into line and figure out a way to do that in a way that minimizes the impacts on our fishery. Fundamentally, people have refused to have the discussion of what is the cost of offshore wind? At what price is that energy coming into the grid for the people of Maine? How big of a development are we looking at for the Gulf of Maine? What are we trying to coexist with? Right now, we're grappling with one wind turbine in state waters as a demonstration, another 12 or so in southern Maine waters, but nobody's told us what's next. So how do we try to cite these things so that they're not interfering with commercial fisheries when we have no idea of what the potential build out's gonna be? Um, nobody has committed to really acknowledging that we don't know what the environmental damage of these is gonna be. We don't know how it's gonna affect the lobster resource. You know, there, there are bits and pieces of science from all around the world but we feel like our ecosystem and our fishery is greatly at risk and nobody is stopping to say, let's answer these important questions and move forward based on information. They're saying, let's move forward and we'll get the information later. That has a lot of our smart fishermen who are paying attention to this really worried that you know, this is all happening regardless of what we do. And we're just putting lipstick on a pig trying to dress up this conversation and pretend it's a planning exercise.